So, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for coming. The key question I want to think about today is uh, how should we treat teenagers? Should we treat teenagers as if they were adults who don't yet know everything? Although sometimes they may think they do. Uh, or do we think of the teenage mind as working a little bit differently? Certainly teenagers sometimes, they can be uh, grumpy, they can do crazy things, they can get into trouble, but all the same time they're passing lots of exams, the kind of uh, exams that I feel I no longer have the ability to pass. So uh, today I'm going to focus on that question and I'm going to be talking about neuroscience uh, as a way to give us insights into that question. So let's start off with uh, some neuroscience data. Here we go. Uh, neuroscience data. And you can see different areas here of the teenage brain. Here we have uh, music. That's the music area. It's fashion. That's me. Very big. Uh, sex, drugs, alcohol. Uh, should I go to college or not or get a job? What about the future? And uh, so rebellion is down here in this area here. Uh, obviously, this is not strictly neuroscience data. This is uh, uh, words written on a brain. <laughs> uh, so I think you can see you're going to be more demanding. I know there's a lot of teachers here. Uh, so I feel if there's teachers here, I should at least be quoting some uh, Shakespeare and some Dickens. So we'll try and uh, squeeze that in as well. I want to start off with a paradox. What is the paradox? Well, the paradox can best be summed up by Charles Dickens. <coughs> uh, here's a quote from A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. And this quote, in a sense, captures the teenage years as a time when many of the cognitive skills that have been developing through childhood, mid-childhood, towards adulthood, are actually reaching, approaching their lifetime peak. Some fantastic cognitive skills there, the kind of cognitive skills that will propel these individuals through so many of their qualifications. And yet, at the same time, there are, uh, should we say, limitations in applying those cognitive abilities to everyday life particularly in the social sphere. So in a sense, we could say it's a tale of two cities. We could also say the paradox is about a tale of two brains. So uh, this is a, a more sensible quote making that point uh, from Rayner and Dougherty. In adolescence and young adulthood, the cognitive skills assumed to underlie educational and economic success are at a lifetime peak. Yet the application of these mental faculties to real life seems woefully inadequate. Instead of learning from experience, reasoning about risks, and making sound decisions, youth often make unhealthy and unsafe choices. Okay, so that is uh, setting up our paradox. And throughout the course of this talk, I want to give some insights into possible answers uh, to reconcile the paradox. Let's start off with some basics. We'll go back and, and think about what is our definition of adolescence. Well, adolescence technically has a biological beginning. It's when puberty begins. And its end of it, the end of uh, adolescence is actually defined culturally in terms of when individuals assume responsible, independent roles uh, in society. And the length of adolescence has varied uh, over historical time. So uh, here we have the olden days, down at the bottom here, olden <coughs> days. Uh, puberty was around 15 years, uh, and individuals assumed their adult roles about 18. So just three years there, teenagers, adolescents, uh, back in the olden days. These days, puberty has moved earlier, so we're looking, the first signs of puberty, say, uh, in, in US studies, suggest that it's happening between 9 and 11. Uh, so puberty 12, by 12 years of age, and yet, independence has been pushed back to maybe 25 years, depending on which country you're in. And part of this is to do with our uh, extended uh, tertiary education. 
Uh, part of it is perhaps to do with our uh, housing crisis, so everyone has to live at home longer. Okay, so how does uh, puberty begin? Well, uh, you probably can't read this at the back. I couldn't when I was standing up there. This is uh, uh, the biological system. This is a brainstem releasing hormones at the onset of puberty. Actually, the action of hormones on the body has been suppressed throughout childhood. And uh, when puberty starts, it's kind of the, re the releasing of a, of a hormonal break that then begins uh, the maturation of uh, uh, primary and secondary sexual characteristics. I'm not so much interested in that today because we're focusing on the brain, so the key question is, what are those hormones doing to the brain? And I have to say, in neuroscience, we don't exactly know the answer to that. We don't know exactly how hormones are changing uh, the activation of brain circuits. Certainly, we know there are actions on um, uh, neurotransmitters, so we can see increased levels of dopamine in the brain. Dopamine, dopamine, we know, is involved in emotional arousal, pleasure and reward, and learning. It gives you a hint about what some of the uh, changes may involve. If you look at testosterone, that also increases. Uh, <coughs> testosterone is known to increase the search for and maintenance of social status, and alters the appraisal of threats and rewards, especially when relevant to social status. So this gives us clues about what some of the changes may involve in terms of the brain. One of the key questions, though, is the individual differences we see. How puberty, how adolescence can turn out so different uh, for different individuals. Now, in many cases, the vast majority of cases, we see very good outcomes. We see uh, responsible, decent individuals emerging with uh, making good choices about their uh, futures. But there are some cases of what I call a, a James Dean in 10, uh, where things go off the rails. So it, it tends to be both educationally in terms of uh, maybe not attending school or drinking or uh, potentially worse things. Uh, that's, that's James Dean. Obviously, you get to look cool uh, if you are a 1960s uh, uh, rebel. <coughs> So what causes these kind of uh, individual differences? We also know in adolescence that it's a risk period for uh, mental health problems. This is a slide I have shamelessly stolen from my colleague down the bottom there, Iroaz Dumantai. So some of the slides I have borrowed from Iroaz, those would be the high quality <coughs> slides. Uh, but you can see here in this plot, this is the age of onset of various different disorders, it's impulse control disorders, substance use disorders, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, schizophrenia. You can see here from 10 years, 20 years, all of these have their onset uh, in many cases in the adolescent years. And here we have 75% of adult mental disorders uh, have their onset before 24 years of age, mostly during adolescence. And indeed, uh, the leading causes of death in adolescence are accidents, violence, and suicide which seems issues associated with uh, mental health problems. Okay, so in the main part of this talk, I'm gonna present to you four different views about what may be going on in the teenage brain. And um, I think all of these are um, correct to some extent. Okay, so all of them have seeds of truth in. And I think uh, the way that the research is heading will look for an integration of elements of all of these aspects. Okay, so let's go back for uh, a reasonably historical view of uh, adolescence. See, I told you I was going to stick Shakespeare in somewhere. <laughs> this is from uh, The Winter's Tale, a uh, quote from William Shakespeare. I would that there were no age between 16 and 3 and 20, or that youth would sleep out the rest, for there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child wronging the ancient, ancient tree, stealing and fighting. So, <clears throat> that's our first theory, then, of uh, adolescence, that, that uh, we <laughs> wish it wasn't there. But I, I put up this quote just to show you that um, the idea that somehow the teenage years were invented in the 1960s is not accurate. This has always been around. We can see there's a variable length in the adolescent years, depending on 
the age of puberty, depending on when people get to be um, independent. But there's always been some transitional phase, and you can find that in cross-cultural studies, this transitional stage where people go from childhood uh, into adulthood. So that was 400 years ago uh, that quote was written. Okay, so we'll move into the 1960s, uh, and this is a, a cognitive theory developed by, uh, um, uh, in this case, it's a quote from Elkind. This is focusing on the teenage years as about <coughs> establishing identity, answering the question, who am I and, and why am I here and what should I do? And it focuses on uh, adolescence as a time of self-focus or uh, egocentrism, and it's just capturing the idea that teenagers can spend a lot of time thinking about themselves. And sometimes their views can be, or their feelings can be, exaggerated in that context. And Elkin captured this in, in two terms. One of them he called the personal fable. One of them he called the imaginary audience. So in the personal fable, there's an overestimation of uniqueness, of feelings and experience, captured by these quotes, my parents can't possibly understand how I really feel. Uh, nobody's ever felt love as deeply as ours. The other one is the imaginary audience, the sensation that one is always performing, being watched, a kind of heightened sense of self-awareness, a feeling of always being on stage, that everyone's going to notice uh, however uh, they're looking and uh, what they're wearing and what they're doing. Okay, so those are our two kind of historical views, and now we're going to uh, bring in neuroscience, see what neuroscience can add to this picture. So, educational neuroscience, relatively recent field, really got going with the emergence of new uh, um, imaging techniques and new methods in neuroscience to be able to see actually what's going on in terms of the human brain and the change in its structure with age. Previously, there was an interaction mainly between psychology and education throughout the 20th century. <coughs> but the new science of learning tries to integrate uh, new findings in neuroscience, but also <coughs> new developments in machine learning and understanding what, what it is to have mechanisms that can learn and how that would work. So I should add some health warnings here when we're going to use neuroscience to try and tell us something about education. And the first thing to say is <coughs> don't just be impressed by brain images. Right? There's actually a, a research topic out there. People are publishing papers right now with the title The Seductive Allure of Neuroscience, generally in education uh, journals, and saying watch out. Uh, if you see, if someone tells you about a new educational technique, and then they put a brain image next to it, you're more likely to believe that's true. Okay. So beware that. Don't just be impressed by brain images. Listen to what the evidence is. Listen to what the ideas are. Evaluate it for itself. Personally, I don't, I don't take this as having any relationship to educational neuroscience. This is kind of an advertising issue going on here called contextual framing. The other issue is uh, this down here it says neuromyth. Neuromyth number four. I'm told there are a range of neuromyths. Don't believe in neuromyths. This one is that there are learning styles. There are other myths like we only use 10% of our brain or we're left brain thinkers or right brain thinkers. So if you want to hear more about uh, these neuromyths, popular misconceptions of, uh, uh, of how the brain works, uh, do go to Jeremy Dudman Jones' workshop afterwards. So those health warnings in place. Let's move on. I'm going to start with an example of the use of neuroscience in the field. This is a couple of quotes from a very influential uh, economist, Nobel Prize winning economist called James Heckman. He's been very influential with policymakers, uh, including in the UK government, in terms of advancing arguments for the importance of intervention in the early years to alleviate the effects of deprivation. Uh, in particular, he makes economic arguments for the importance of uh, the education system investing in early, uh, the early years. But this is one of his papers where he was making those arguments and a couple of quotes he makes. He says, different types of abilities appear to be manipulable at different ages. IQ scores, that's intelligence, become stable by age 10. 
10 or so, suggesting a sensitive period for the formation of these skills below age 10. There is evidence that adolescent interventions can affect non-cognitive skills. This evidence is supported in the neuroscience that establishes the malleability of the prefrontal cortex into the early 20s. This is the region of the brain that governs emotion and self-regulation. So, broadly you'll see, I think, this is right. And you may hear more about that in the later workshops. It's this quote here which we're going to consider in the next few slides. In particular, I was involved in, in publishing a paper, this is back in 2011, 2012, uh, looking at intelligence changes across the teenage years. Uh, and ultimately rejecting the view that intelligence is fixed by age 10. Now, uh, actually this, this paper caused quite a lot of interest in the media. This is uh, the Guardian and the Metro and the BBC News site picking up that IQ can change in teenage years. There turns out to be a lot of interest in the media in things to do with teenagers. So you could take this to mean one of two things. One of them is that uh, teenagers really are that important and everyone is interested in teenagers. Or you could take it to mean that most of the journalists working in the media have teenage children and it's really important for them. Okay, so let's go in a little bit more about uh, this particular study. Uh, and this was a study where um, uh, we had uh, a group of teenagers to begin with. We tested them in 2004. They were between 13 and 15 years of age. And then they came back four years later and had another set of tests. And they were doing two kinds of things. We were giving them intelligence tests. Uh, and you can break down scores by your verbal reasoning and your nonverbal reasoning, sometimes called verbal and, and performance uh, IQ. So we tested them twice, and what you're looking at here is the score in 2008 for verbal IQ plotted against the score uh, in 2004. And mostly, it's a straight line. So if you were uh, scoring uh, below or a bit lower in 2004, you'd score a bit, bit lower in 2008. So generally, there's reasonable degree of consistency in intelligence over time. So there are not wild fluctuations, right? However, if you look at these graphs, you can find individuals. Here's a guy here who scored at, uh, on, on the verbal IQ at, what about, a, uh, 110. Uh, and then in 2008, below 100. So that's like a change of 10 IQ points. And here's an individual in nonverbal reasoning who was scoring at, uh, well, that's 120. That one's held consistent. There's one here that was scoring at 100 and is now down to 80. So we can see that that that's one here that, that was at 100 and now gone up to 120. So actually, you can find in some individuals IQ point changes by up to 20 IQ points. Uh, the question is, we can't always be confident in how accurate our <laughs> IQ measures are. So maybe that's kind of noise, the lack of correlation. This, this is a kind of mismeasurement issue. So one of the things we can look at is uh, we can plot the change in time over performance IQ with verbal IQ, and we find these are uncorrelated. <coughs> so you can have your verbal IQ can go up in four years, and your uh, nonverbal IQ may stay the same, or go up or go down. Okay. But there's still an issue about whether this is a real effect. And given that the consensus out there is that everything should stabilize by about age 10, it's important to follow this up. One of the ways to do that is to look at brain structure. And it so happened that we scanned the brain structure of these individuals at the first time point and the second. And what you're going to look at here are, um, this is a, a, an MRI image from the MRI scanner uh, showing a, a slice through the brain. And you can see on the outside here there's gray matter and on the inside is white matter. If you, the brain is made up of uh, uh, 100 billion odd neurons. And neurons have, uh, where are we, a uh, cell body, and then uh, connections to other neurons. So these are the inputs <coughs> to this neuron, and then a, a connection called the axon, connecting to other neurons. These bits at the beginning, the cell body and the local connections, and the connections here to the next neuron, they make up the gray matter. And the connection between it accumulates a substance called myelin, which helps it transmit signals, and that's white. It's kind of fatty. 
So this stuff here makes up the white matter. These are all connections between brain regions. The bit on the outside is the gray matter, so it's the cell bodies and the local connections. Okay. So what we're going to measure is the amount of gray matter <coughs> in the brain at those two time points and see whether any of the changes in the structure of the brain correlate with the changes in IQ. And <coughs> already said those. that's indeed what we found. We found areas of the brain actually corresponding with what's called phonological processing, speech output, <coughs> where you've got more gray matter if your IQ went up over time. And areas in red, you can't see here, it's more to do with the ma manipulation of fingers, in fact, <coughs> where you have more gray matter if your nonverbal IQ went up in time. And there were some regions that correlated with both. So the important point to take from this, I'm not going to go into details about what these particular regions mean, it's just that if those measurement, if the, the measured changes in IQ weren't real, if they were just measurement error, you wouldn't find correlated changes in the brain. So what you're using here is brain imaging evidence just to demonstrate that there are real changes in IQ across the teenage years. <laughs> Mostly consistent, but there can be some big changes. Now, this study doesn't tell us what is causing those changes. It could be the unfolding of potential, or it could be you've chosen to attend math classes and, and not so many languages, for instance. So it could be uh, uh, the choice of topics. But what it does tell you is that teachers should be cautious about <coughs> predicting academic success based on those early educational tests, such as the 11 plus exam. OK, so. <coughs> Let's think a little bit more. What we're now plotting is that white matter and gray matter, or the total amount of brain, and this is how much of it there is in cubic <laughs> centimeters. And we've got age along the bottom here. And I've just shown you 5 to 10. So in terms of white matter, it's going up a bit. Gray matter, reasonably stable. Total brain, reasonably stable. A lot of variability between individuals. But in terms of change over time, <coughs> not a lot. So the question is, what happened next? We can reveal this kind of change. Actually, the amount of gray matter goes down across age. So all the time you're getting cleverer in the teenage years, and you're passing your GCSEs and going on to your AS levels and your A levels and then attending university, the amount of gray matter in your brain is going down. But the amount of white matter is going up. So we see throughout the teenage years continued change in the structure of the brain. What is that change? Well, the increase in white matter is probably, you can think of it in terms of insulating the connections, improving the electrical conductance, how good the signaling is along the brain connections, the ones you think uh, are important. And then in terms of reduction of gray matter, it's streamlining, cutting away those spare local connections that you don't need, that were useless. They gave you potential, but if you're not going to use them, there's no point in keeping them there. So this is a plot just focusing on the gray matter of what's changing in the brain across the teenage years. And uh, the red means there's a lot of gray matter. And as it, it goes down to blue, there is a reduction in gray matter. So what you're seeing here is this streamlining process throughout the teenage years. And the thing to focus on as it repeats is what are the areas that go blue the last? You should see it's an area here and an area around here. Those are the last areas. So the last areas to mature in terms of this streamlining process turn out to be areas involved in cognitive control and social cognition. And this parallels the findings that we see in the behavioral studies where we see the skills that are still developing in adolescence are related to social cognition and cognitive control. So social cognition that is how we process, store, and use information about other people and how this influences our own behavior and feelings and interactions. Cognitive control is more about self-regulation, so adapting, being flexible in your behavior uh, to achieve your goals in the uh, uh, environment you find yourself in. Obviously, I should say these are skills that are developing. There are all sorts of achievements that are going on at the same time. We shouldn't, shouldn't play those down. Okay. We can get to a lower level of granularity and think, well, what specific <coughs> skills are sh still showing developmental improvement? Well, it's things like planning ahead, 
inhibiting inappropriate responses, understanding how current actions have future consequences. So in a sense, it's to do with impulsivity. Do I plan ahead or do I do something in the moment? Uh, assessment of risk, taking another person's perspective, and importantly, resistance to peer influence. This led to our third theory, theoretical perspective, called frontocortical immaturity. Immature frontal cortex. So this is the uh, immaturity hypothesis. It's the idea that the subcortical brain, somehow you, people might think of it as more primitive or emotional, that part of the brain uh, which processes things like emotion and risk and threat processing, that's developing more quickly than the frontal cortical areas involved in cognitive control. And what that produces, that mismatch in the development, the rate of development of those two systems, uh, is more emotional or less rational decisions uh, in which long-term outcomes are not sufficiently weighted. And as a consequence, there's a, a greater risk of impulsive or dangerous behavior. Uh, turns out not to be a new idea, this kind of two systems slightly at odds with each other. You can trace it back to the beginning of the 20th century in the works of Freud, where the emotional subcortical system would be the id, and then it's being gradually controlled by the ego as a secondary process. And there's a nice graph, uh, as plotted by uh, B.J. Casey, uh, uh, American uh, neuroscientist and her colleagues, where we think about functional development over age. There's the uh, uh, subcortical systems, emotional reward, developing quickly, and there's a slow extended development of prefrontal cortex, and uh, it's this gap in the middle where one of them is ahead of the others, where you might get these uh, uh, problems in these advanced social skills and advanced behavioral regulation. This view says kind of, it's kind of like an adult brain, but it's, kind of, it's broken in a way. It's just not yet working properly. Give it time, give it time, and it'll get there, this gap will close, and it'll all come together and everything will work nicely. I want to have a look at some of the neuroscience data supporting this view. And I'll focus in particular on, on the peer influence during adolescence. So adolescence is a, a time where the view of others and the social context seems to uh, have an exaggerated influence on people's behavior and their decision making. So there's some different bits of evidence here that adolescent girls are more sensitive to social exclusion, that uh, we find that adolescents in the statistics, mostly commit crimes when they're in the company of their peers, whereas if you look at an, uh, adults committing uh, crime, they tend to be alone. And also we find this elevation in uh, risk-taking behavior when in the company of peers. So let's look at a couple of specific studies. This is a study by Chen et al., uh, published in 2011, and it's based on uh, uh, driving computer games. Okay, so I don't know whether you can see these images, you're driving along a road and you come to intersections and there are traffic lights there. Now the important thing in the game is get to the end as quickly as possible. So it's kind of reward there, you've got to go fast. Uh, when you get to these junctions, the traffic lights, what do you do when they're at amber? Now if you're a London driver, <laughs> put your foot down. Uh, but really, you should slow down and stop, right? But if you stop, you might be late, you know, you're going to miss all the lights all the way along. Uh, but there's a risk in accelerating at amber that someone might be jumping the lights. So there's some risk of a crash. Okay, so in this game, uh, you have to do it as quickly as possible. You have to decide what risks you take. But importantly in this game, two things. You can, you're carrying it out while in a brain scanner, so we can look at the activation of the brain. Uh, but also you're either doing it in company of, uh, with friends uh, or on your own. Now, obviously, the, the friends aren't in the brain scanner with you, technically. There's only room, oh, there's a picture of brain scanner, there's only room for one in there. But, but you know they're in the control room and that they're like, it's like playing games on the internet with your friends and they're laughing and japing and stuff. Okay, so your friends are there uh, or they're not doing it on your own. All right, so here's some results. You're looking at how many risky decisions, and we've got adolescents, young adults, or adults, and the blue is if you're on your own, and uh, the red is if you're doing the game with peers around. And you can see adolescents 
many more risky decisions, putting their foot down at the intersections. Uh, and number of crashes, yeah, we're seeing that's higher as well. So it's a particular effect of the peer influence uh, on the risky decision making. Let's look inside the brain. What we're looking at here is kind of baseline, and these are adolescents, young adults, adults. We can see that adults are showing more activity in this frontal area of the brain, lateral prefrontal cortex, the name doesn't matter. This is a kind of cognitive control area, and we're seeing it doesn't matter whether there are peers or not. So as you get older, you get these better control skills. Okay. Now a couple of other regions, ventral striatum, orbital frontal cortex, these are areas involved in uh, reward and decisions, uh, the way uh, rewards uh, influence decisions. And you can see in the adolescents much more activity in the peer condition than not, uh, and here in these two regions. So you can think of these using the technical term as showing off brain regions. They light up when you're showing off to your friends, but you get a higher level of crashes. This is another study. This is by uh, Sebastian and colleagues out of uh, uh, Sarah Jane Blakemore's lab. It's called the Social Exclusion Game, Cyberball. All right, so you've got to, got to get into this game. We're playing catch. Uh, this is me here. I get the ball. I throw it over there. He throws it over there. It's coming, it's coming my way. Yeah, nice. And then we carry on, and it goes over there. And uh, oh, wait, isn't, uh, isn't it my turn? Uh, um, it's coming. Uh, hey, guys, have you stopped playing with me? OK, so this is a social exclusion game. And we're going to do that with uh, young adolescents, 11 to 13, mid-adolescents, 14 to 15, and some uh, adults. And what's going to happen is we're going to rate the mood. So there's a questionnaire, rate your mood before and after the social exclusion experience. <clears throat> and you can see that, uh, um, particularly uh, in the young adults, big drop there in the mood afterwards. Uh, overall. Uh, the the mid-adolescent, their overall uh, mood is lower, so they are a bit grumpier. That's scientific evidence right there. But in terms of the drop, you can see there's a bigger drop here and here, but not as much of a drop um, here in the adults in the exclusion condition when you're um, cut out of the game. In terms of brain regions, uh, we can see greater activations associated with uh, poorer resistance to peer influence in the adolescence only. So these are kind of some social exclusion areas, some uh, really feeling upset you've been left out of things. And then in adults, you can see more activation in regions uh, to do with perhaps with the regulation <coughs> of social distress. So me as an adult can say, oh, I didn't want to play the game anyway. It's a silly game. Oh, I shouldn't be upset. So a bit of text on this. I just want to specifically be clear about some of the data which I find interesting here. Uh, not only are we showing differences and a particular uh, vulnerability to social exclusion in, in young teenagers, uh, young adolescents, but also activity in one of the subcortical areas uh, was reduced in individuals who have many friends in daily life. So that suggests that uh, these kind of effects may be modulated or reduced by the size of your social network. And in another brain area, the subgenital uh, anterior cingulate cortex, blah, 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 um, social exclusion, so in this study, the size of the activation, age 12 to 13, predicted which individuals uh, were going to show depressive symptoms in the following year. So in some sense, this was picking up vulnerability to later problems. OK. So that's the third of our views, the frontocortical immaturity hypothesis. Now, I like it. It's a good hypothesis. Lots of data there. It kind of fits, uh, in some sense, with what we see. But, there is a but, there are three possible reasons for <coughs> dumb choices. There are probably more than three, but here's at least three reasons for dumb choices uh, I can think of by introspecting often. Uh, Obviously, there's the impulsive lack of control, and that's the one we're looking at at the, the frontal cortical <coughs> immaturity hypothesis. Second one, though, is, you know, I thought it was worth the risk. Now, as a teenager, you may not have a good understanding of risk, but you may think, you know, okay, I walked across a bridge on the railings to impress my friends, but I, I really wanted to impress them, right? So maybe it was worth the risk into your conception. 
Or another one is, look, I knew it was wrong, but I was just really angry or excited or in love or whatever, you know, so overcome by an emotional state such that the whole system, it's not like you just couldn't control what you were doing in, in the sense of, I knew the risk, but I did it anyway, couldn't stop myself. This is, the whole system was overwrought emotionally. Okay, so at least three possibilities, and the, the hypothesis we've just seen just talks about that. It turns out that if you ask teenagers in these decision-making uh, uh, experiments, give people scenarios, ask them to decide what they're going to do, and then later ask them what their subjective risk-reward analysis is, it turns out that, that their analysis often predicts their decision. So actually it's not always the case that there is a lack of control. Sometimes it's more this number two, I thought it was worth the risk, <laughs> rather than being unable to control yourself. And indeed, sometimes the estimation of risk looks better than in adults. We'll come back to this in a second, but it's this idea, it's a manifestation of idealism, seeing things almost perhaps more clearly than adults do. Okay, so we're going to move on to the um, fourth perspective, and this one's more comparative. We're going to think about social primates, we're going to think about what we can learn from animals here. And uh, I'm going to pose a puzzle up the top here. Here's our question. How do you genetically build something? So here we're going to have bees or we're going to have uh, gorillas. How do you genetically build something to later in its life transform its behavior? Okay, so if you think about honeybees, honeybees have different roles in the hive. There's a cleaner, a nurse, a builder, a guard, a forager. They have different behaviors. So like the, the guard, that likes to hang around at the entrance to the hive, and then if anyone strange comes in, it gives them a hard time, you know, bounces them back out. The forager, got to be outside the hive, got to be navigating via the sun, got to find nice flowers, collect nectar, get back to the hive, and so forth. It turns out that all of these roles, that's the same honeybee at different ages. But just it's kind of matured, it's changed somehow. And it turns out this is not exactly age programmed, because if you go into the hive and start squishing foragers, so there's not enough bees bringing nectar back to the hive, all of a sudden the guards accelerate their development to replace the foragers. Okay? So it's not strictly programmed. We've got something similar here, where this is a gorilla, so this is an infant, and then they're growing up to be <coughs> youngsters and maybe. Adolescent gorillas having fights with each other, play fights, rough and tumble. And then later on you have an adult, so this is a silverback who's running his own uh, social group. So you've got a similar challenge here that uh, you're messing around with your family, they're looking after you, they're keeping you safe because you're so small, but at some point you need to stop hanging around with your family and you need to compete with your peers to establish your position in the dominance hierarchy. And if you, some of that involves taking risks, right? You've got to have fights and try things out, find out who you can beat, who you can't beat, because if you don't do that, you're going to end up at the bottom of that dominance hierarchy. You won't stand a chance of um, getting to be the silverback. So how is that done? The problem we've got is that the behavior of uh, organisms, even as, you know, this is still quite a complicated organism, the behavior of these organisms is determined by the strength of the connections between the neurons. And those connections are not specified genetically. They are built by experience and learning from experience. So even in this forager honeybee, how you use the light to navigate to particular flowers and then get the nectar and bring it back, that has to be the outcome of learning. All right, so we've got the puzzle here uh, based on the neuroscience of honeybees. So looking at honeybees, taking apart their brains, looking at the neurons, looking at the genes being expressed in the neurons. This looks like the answer. You use hormones to change motivation. And then with that new motivation, that causes the individual to seek out new environments. At the same time, the hormones increase the plasticity of the brain in the circuits that are going to have to learn new things. And then in the new environment where the uh, organism finds itself, it then has a sort of faster learning of the new behaviors. 
in the honeybee research, this was looking at, at neurons and gene expression uh, involved in um, uh, processing the signal from the antennae, which are involved in uh, navigation. OK, so if we take this perspective and we generate a hypothesis about what's going on with social primates, the idea might be that, well, the hormonal changes are being used to signal uh, the, the puberty, so there'll be some physical changes. But what they'll do in the brain is to change motivation. You won't want to hang out with your family anymore. You will want to hang out with your peers. And you will want to fight, as it were, for your position in the social dominance hierarchy. And that may involve taking risks. So that would be a hypothesis. At the same time, we're expecting to find greater plasticity in the brain systems that are going to be involved in learning how to make decisions uh, in those circumstances. So what do we find if we look at the, the literature? We actually find the claim that hormones in puberty contribute to adolescent risk-taking in two ways. Increase the motivational salience of acquiring social status and increasing the tendency to seek novel and high-intensity effective experiences, especially in social contexts with opportunities to gain peer admiration. So that fits with the idea that hormones are changing the motivation, particularly in a socially relevant way. And then some more recent research is proposing uh, that adolescence may be a sensitive period of brain development. There's greater plasticity for learning. There's one study here uh, um, by Lisa Knoll <coughs> showing that, that uh, late in adolescence, learning of, of relational reasoning is actually faster in younger uh, um, adolescents. It goes against the idea that the brain is becoming less plastic. It's a skill that is actually faster learning of these high-level reasoning skills later in adolescence. I'll say a caveat about this view. If you think of guerrilla hierarchies that are reasonably simple, as someone at the top, someone at the bottom, humans are much more complicated in that sense. So this is a quote from uh, Dan Sapolsky, who studies baboon social hierarchies. Uh, he says, humans are not hierarchical in the linear, unidimensional manner of many species. For example, humans belong to multiple hierarchies and tend to value the one uh, in which they rank the highest. For example, a low-prestige employee who most values his role as a deacon in his church. Furthermore, the existence of internal standards makes humans less subject to the psychological consequences of rank. You might think of that as ethics or uh, morality. So there, there are complications to this perspective. All right, so in this view, here's what happens. Hormones change the motivation, no longer want to be with family, want to be with peers. Decide what risks to take using a risk-reward analysis. Uh, Decision-making skills, planning, anticipating consequences, and being able to control your behavior. Then you get feedback from the world about whether that was a sensible <coughs> risk to take. Should I go up on the dance floor and show my moves, or will I be horribly embarrassed? You get feedback on that. And then eventually, through some set of experiences, you learn sensible risks to take, uh, that is, risks in context. So in this view, adolescence isn't like the adult brain that's broken a bit. It's a normal social primate behavior for that phase uh, in development. There is, however, something to be said for the view that I started off with, that maybe teenagers don't know everything. So there may be issues about you know, a lack of life experience. So we'll get back to this issue that sometimes adolescents are hyper-rational, are naively idealistic. And what is missing from some of their decision making is experience-based intuition to understand the meaning of risks in context, like rules of thumb, hard-won wisdom, heuristics, and so forth. So it's kind of the difference between knowing the odds when you're playing a card game and actually playing poker. What are good decisions uh, with the odds in context? To give you a more concrete example, this is my cool teenager, and he's wondering whether he should have unprotected sex with his girlfriend. He does an analysis of the odds, and this is what it reveals to him. Odds are she probably won't get pregnant. <coughs> now, the odds are she probably won't get pregnant, at least on any one occasion. But you'd still think that that's a not, not a good uh, use of the probabilities. Really, he might then think, well, what are these rules of thumb? They say better safe than sorry. In general, ethically, 
I'm, it's better not to risk hurting, hurting my partner. These are things that we learn over time, either through experience or wisdom passed on to us. And you can see how, in this approach, knowing the risks isn't enough. You need to inform them via experience. So there's something to be said about, about life experience and gaining it. Uh, I'm going to say just a couple of things about other influences here. So, the importance of technology these days and about how it interacts with uh, adolescent experience. Now we have mobile phones uh, and social media that may alter the social media um, uh, that we're uh, interacting with and indeed the consequence of our choice. So, in the 1960s they talked about <coughs> the imaginary audience. Now the audience is real. Everyone is reading your post. Well, some people anyway. Uh, and the consequences of your action, instead of uh, just upsetting someone in the playground, now you get the idea of cyberbullying. So the technological advances in society may exaggerate, sometimes attenuate the effects of um, adolescent behavior. I should say um, we are carrying out a big project, Caroline mentioned at the beginning, looking at <coughs> a study of cognition, adolescence, and mobile phones in 6,000 teenagers. Uh, within the M25 area. We haven't yet analyzed all our data, but uh, invite me back next year. I'll tell you what the results are. Culture. Let's think about the effects of behavior may be fashioned a little bit by culture. So the same hormone changes can produce different behaviors in different cultures. Imagine um, I'm highly competitive here. That might make a lot of testosterone. might make me aggressive. I might want to compete to be the best. But if I'm in a Buddhist monastery, being the best means being the kindest. I am the most compassionate guy out there. I'm going to be more compassionate than you. Obviously, you can see that's a beneficial outcome uh, given the cultural um, context. And indeed, the same peer influence that can produce negative effects in risk taking could be harnessed for beneficial outcomes. So there's evidence that academic performance and motivation improve when students spend time with academically high achieving peers. There's evidence that adolescents' pro-social behavior increases when they spend time with friends with higher levels of pro-social behavior. So peer influences can be for uh, the benefit as well. Down here, skills, uh, decision-making and executive function skills can be improved through training, role play, and so forth. Uh, things indeed like uh, mindfulness training, which if you go to Iroa's Dumantai session, she'll talk about. Uh, Consequences as well. The way we build our environments means that the consequences of certain kinds of decisions can be better or worse. So you can think about it, embarrassment of bad dancing, but if you get in that car and show off to your friends and crash it, that's really severe consequences of that bad decision and drug overdoses and so forth. So in a sense, it's up to us to regulate the risks that can be taken in our culture and mediate the consequences of, of uh, risky decisions. I know teachers like to know what they can do different in a classroom on Monday morning. So I, I can recommend this document, Enhancing and Practicing Executive Function Skills with Children from Infancy to Adolescence. It's downloadable uh, and it gives a set of recommendations for exercises around things like goal setting, planning and monitoring, tools for self-monitoring, activities to practice self-regulation skills and study skills. Uh, to get this document seemed to be a very long web address. So I did create a tiny URL, which was YD7APBLO. But yeah, take a photo of that. Look at that document. I do recommend it. OK, so going to wrap up. Conclusion, <coughs> there are now these more sophisticated uh, models thinking of development of different parts of the brain and uh, how they interact. And this is positive growth trajectories where everything turns out well, and negative growth trajectories uh, where things go off the rails. I'm kind of more interested in, in these individual differences and what we may be able to change to, to minimize their impact. So I'm going to go back to this diagram and think about, well, what are the environmental factors influencing this? Hormone change. Uh, Puberty is affected by some of these biological environment influences, <laughs> diet, stress, so forth. The environment here provides opportunities for taking risks and learning life lessons. 
The environment provides feedback. <coughs> so what can we change here? What can we intervene upon? Well, let's have a look at what differs. In principle, environments differ. There are different <laughs> amounts of opportunities for taking risks. There are different strengths in motivational change in puberty. Uh, some of those neural systems can be more or less vulnerable in different individuals to the hormonal changes producing mental health problems. We can see differences between individuals in their risk analysis and decision making. Differences in people's, you know, how explorative, how crazy or angry or sedate or they will be in, in the teenage years. Differences in the rate of learning life lessons. And as I just alluded to, differences in the severity of uh, consequences of bad decisions. And down here, some of these neural systems, uh, if they're vulnerable, the hormonal changes can lead to mental health problems, depression, OCD, eating disorders, and so forth, which you can address with therapy, such as uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay, so where would we intervene to improve outcomes? Here are some points where you could intervene, but it's quite hard. So one can change culture to try and make, you know, change the timing of puberty, but, you know, part of those changes are to do with improved diet, for instance. I'm not sure we want to mess with those kind of things. The differences in the strength of motivational change, that really tends to be more genetically driven. And also how quickly people learn from life lessons, uh, differences in how daring and crazy uh, kids are. These things are, it may in principle be possible to change them, but quite hard. These are things, I think, where there are better opportunities to intervene. Creating environments that provide more opportunities for taking risks and learning life lessons, but with reduced severity of consequences. Okay, so opportunities to learn more quickly. Uh, opportunities here to improve decision-making and risk analysis. And ultimately, opportunities to detect risk and therefore have early intervention to address potential mental health problems. Okay, so I'll finish off just by concluding on what I think neuroscience adds here. I'll repeat that health warning. Don't be impressed by that. Don't believe those. But thinking about the possible routes from neuroscience to education, avoiding neuromyths. So I should be clear, if neuroscience is going to have an impact on education, it's the outcome of a collaboration between <coughs> multiple parties, neuroscientists, psychologists, teachers, policymakers. So changes will only come about by dialogue and it's as much teachers directing neuroscientists to important questions as it is the other way around. But if we do have these influences, you can think of some direct routes uh, to education and some indirect routes via psychology. Uh, at the beginning, I talked about this sort of different use where you're just using neuroscience as independent evidence of what's changing. It doesn't give you a lot of in insights, it just confirms some of the things you're seeing in behavior. We have the advantage in neuroscience of offering a mechanistic explanation integrated with biology. And in terms of interventions using the direct route, we might think in terms of biology before psychology, of addressing issues like sleep, diet, exercise, stress reduction. For example, you might have heard quite a lot about teenagers and sleep and the differences in their body clock and the potential of starting the, the school day later for teenagers. Uh, executive function training, this is kind of via psychology of thinking about how do those skills get involved in um, decision making and can we train those so we can uh, make decisions about risk in context. And then also potentially about pointing to environments we can change to improve the opportunities of, for learning and reduce the consequences. But of course, any time we want to intervene, we can't just think narrowly. We have to think about the broader conception of education within societal structures. To give the example of changing the, the timing of the school day for teenagers, that's very hard to do since there's so many other related factors to do with family life and, and the professional life of uh, uh, teachers and uh, all the support stuff. Okay, so just to finish, I should say mostly they're your adults not teenagers, there were some teenagers here, their brains are changing and I can now reveal to you adults, your brains are changing too. Uh, this is a paper out this year looking at uh, small changes in the strength of the connections <laughs> in your brains between uh, early to mid adulthood. Okay, so there's some excitement for adults, your brains are changing too, but unfortunately that's aging. That's why 
uh, you guys continually get beat by the teenagers uh, at the video games. So uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks particularly to Irawaz Dimitai for letting me butcher some of her slides and uh, very happy to answer any questions.